This week on the Back Table Podcast. In my talk the other day, I kind of showed an extreme case of a vertebral plane with a lot of posterior expo- uh, retropulsion of a large fragment that uh, I think a lot of people would have been initially, uh, including myself, uh, really hesitant to take on that case. But it really helps build your practice if you're uh, someone that uh, is willing to take some measured risks. So I, I tell my patients, not all of them, but the, I tell my patients, listen, you've got this situation and... Um, if you're able to, you know, trust me, uh, I am going to be cautiously aggressive for you to, to really help you, you know, given um, these risks, we're going to um, take these safety precautions to make sure that you're as safe as possible. But we have a really good shot of helping you out and, and making you feel better. Hello, and welcome to the Backtable podcast. Backtable is your resource to connect with your IR colleagues and learn tips, techniques, and the ins and outs of the devices in your cabinets. This is Sabine Dond as your guest host, coming to you straight from the Exhibitors Hall at Western Angio Society in Maui 2018. Western Angio, <clears throat> Peter, how are you doing? How are you liking Western Angio? I'm loving it. Uh, yeah. This is a fantastic meeting, my favorite meeting of the year, and i um, just having a wonderful time here. The speakers are great. The friends are great. So uh, it's a good time to catch up with people and meet new uh, Twitter friends, and uh, and that's a little awkward sometimes. But uh, <laughs> we get to meet each other and hang out and uh, learn a lot, so it's fantastic. Thanks for having me. No problem. I, I think uh, you know Western Angio tends to be kind of a one of the most amazing uh society meetings yeah. in, in the best places so yeah, i'm really excited to exactly i'm sitting here doing this interview in my bike shorts so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i got i got uh, <laughs> uh yelled at for wearing pants to my presentation today <laughs> but uh so peter let me know uh you know where do you work and, and tell me a little bit about your practice uh sure sure so i'm with diversified radiology of colorado it's i've uh, been there 10 years since i graduated fellowship at the daughter and and uh, it's a private practice of DR and IR. We have about 60 radiologists, maybe 65 now, with six IRs. We cover six hospitals, four of them are large-ish, and two very peripheral community hospitals. Um, but I work at mainly just one larger downtown hospital where I've built my practice. Nice. And again, how long have you been there for? Ten years. Ten years. I'm getting that's old. A lot of hospitals covered. <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know, um, just a little introduction on me. I am Sabine Don, and I work in LA at PIH Health. Kind of a smaller. No, I don't cover as many hospitals as you, Peter, but I uh, work across the board, both neuro and body, and really have enjoyed you know the past three years of being uh, out of fellowship now. So. Uh, I, you know, in my fellowship, I never did vertebral augmentation, and I'm wondering, how did you learn it? Were you trained in it in your in your training, or did you learn it on the job? That's a good question. So I actually had a little bit of training in um, at the daughter uh, with uh, Brian Peterson. He invented the dips procedure. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's since retired, but he uh, was transitioning. He was kind of pivoting into neurointerventional radiology or INR um, towards the end of his career where he was doing stroke intervention and, uh, you know, aneurysm coiling. But he was kind of the go-to guy for vertebroplasty at the VA there in, in, uh, in Portland. So I got my training from him, which was pretty much a unipredicular vertebroplasty uh, approach, kind of quick and dirty, and that was before... Um, um, the uh, ablation technology really came around that we'll yeah. talk about later. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. And now, how how many would you say how many vertebral vertebral augmentations, and then you know how much of those are pathologic are you treating? Mm-hmm. That's a good question. I think like probably like most uh, practices, most of our vertebral augmentation is in uh, osteoporotic compression fractures um, in the elderly. Um, and then I would say at this point, maybe five to ten percent of ours are malignant, uh, typically osteolytic uh, compression fractures, but sometimes uh, they can be blastic, particularly from prostate. But uh, most of our um, vertebral augmentation in spinal tumors has been the uh, osteolytic colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and even some osteolytic um, prostate cancer. Good. Yeah, you know, five to ten percent is, is quite a bit, you know, in my practice. You know, we do maybe about anywhere between two to five 
uh, vertebral augmentations a month, mm -hmm. but I would say 1% of those or so are pathologic. And, and so how are you getting these referrals? Where are these patients coming from? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, tumor board is probably the main uh, source of those. Uh, the, uh, as I talked to my, in my talk the other day, the, uh, the lunchroom and the doctor's lounge, uh, pretty important uh, because, you know, that's every day of the week. Uh, tumor board is just one day a week. So the, uh, the referrals typically come from that angle. Um, and fortunately, where I work, uh, not, a, not every place has this, um, has this uh, setup, but uh, our radiation oncologists are actually employees of the hospital. So while they do have a productivity um, sort of standard they have to meet, they are so busy just doing their regular radiation therapy that um, they don't have any problem at all in referring to me for help in managing these patients who have painful compression fractures and that are malignant. Yeah, that's an excellent setup. You know, is it at the tumor board when these do come up, is it you kind of raising your hand during the board saying, hey, this is what you can do, or are more physicians becoming familiar, at least yeah. at your institution, with right. this procedure? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the beginning, it was, it was me raising my hand. It was like, uh, hey, pick me, pick me. I, I, can, I can help out here. Uh, and uh, after um, a few cases and bringing back some success stories back to the tumor board and doing a little presentation with the data and uh, some of the trials that have been done, um, or the data that's been uh, produced from some perspective and retrospective trials, um, the people are now on board. So now it's just part of the treatment uh, options for these patients. Um, still, I think most patients tend to come after radiation has failed, mm -hmm. um, but we are getting some of the sort of upfront painful lytic lesions that are you know, so bad and so painful that they really want to get the the um, the patient treated a lot sooner and get them get them more pain free. So, um, because we all know the radiation therapy works, but it does take a long time. So if they're really trying to get on someone's acute pain and break that cycle, they'll, they'll uh, refer to me for the combination of ablation and, uh, and uh, augmentation. Great. So, you know, we're kind of a little bit getting our he ahead of ourselves as far as the procedure itself. I mean, most, most of us are familiar with vertebral augmentation, whether it's balloon kyphoplasty and, and vertebral plasty, but what now, with these pathologic fractures, can you just kind of describe your technique? What is going in there? Why are we combining thermal uh, into this into this procedure? Sure, sure. Well, yeah, so uh, these patients often come with a diagnosis uh, that's been confirmed uh, metastatic disease, but um, uh, some of these patients do need biopsies um, just to confirm diagnosis. Uh, sometimes it can be a little confusing on imaging whether or not a, a fracture is actually pathologic or not. But basically, um, yeah, I do mind under uh, typically a MAC anesthesia. Uh, patients um, you know, uh, will get on the table and we'll, we'll do a um, uh, bilateral predict transparticular approach. At my institution, we use the uh, Medtronic Osucool RF ablation device. I've used the, um, the Merit uh, star ablation um, uh, set up as well but at, at other institutions but the um, the main one we use is the Medtronic device so uh, bilateral transpedicular approach typically is if it's a larger tumor if it's a single pet particular lesion well I'll just do a unipedicular approach um, also you introduce her in just like your other uh, cannula that you're used to using and then uh, there's a little drill that the osteocool device comes in with that allows you to measure the length of the probe for the ablation that you'll need. And then after that, the, um, the ablation probes are put in, which are water-cooled. Um, the cortex actually acts as a nice insulator, so you don't, if you have an intact cortex, you don't have to worry about uh, heating up the spinal cord, which is nice. Mm -hmm. But um, then uh, after the ablation done, which is typically 10 to 15 minutes, uh, probes come out, um, kyphoplasty balloons go in, inflate the balloons, those out, obviously, just the rest of it's like a kyphoplastic procedure. If you have a particular lesion, also, uh, that, that you can ablate that on the way out by changing the parameters of the, of the, uh, the target temperature, the ablation time, et cetera. 
And can you do that? You, you mentioned these p particular lesions. Can you do that with both systems, or is, is one system your kind of go-to device for doing a particular lesion? Yeah, I, I, I do like the uh, bipolar device uh, from the Medtronic, so um, I think it works really well. I haven't had any issues with complications of that. I think you really dial in your ablation zone nicely with that. How um, much time added does, does the RF portion add? Case. Yeah, so the ablation times are typically 10 to 15 minutes, so just in another minute or so um, to actually place in the probes. So it doesn't add very much mm -hmm. at all. And, you know, I guess we always do get scared about thermal injury. You know, you mentioned it, especially if you're going on the pedicle. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen thermal injury to the, to the exiting nerve roots or anything like that? Uh, never look. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, not that I know of. Uh, we haven't. Now, if you do have an extra osseous component, uh, sometimes those can be difficult to actually ablate completely. And those are ones actually that are, that's a nice um, combined therapy with your rad onc. You know, you can do to take care of most of the intravertebral stuff. And then if there's an extra osseous component that may be um, to the side, uh, yeah. paravertebral, whatever, they can often um, hit that with some uh, XRT and and uh, get the patient treated completely. You mentioned something very interesting yesterday in your talk, and uh, you said that a lot of times you combine ESI or epidural mm -hmm. steroid injections after your procedure. How, how are you doing that? How often are you doing that, and, and why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So the, um, you know, every once in a while, it's, it's not the majority of patients. We do have patients that have radicular pain, and it seems like the thoracic compression fractures have more of a radicular component to them than, than the lumbar. And they have their, they will describe this radiating sharp pain that's around uh, in a, in a costal um, distribution. So um, I talked to them about this before, and I think that offering an ESI uh, to the procedure, and I typically do an interlaminar because there's often like a bilateral um, component to these. If it's unilateral, I'll do a transframal for sure, but but adding that in there really helps, I think, in my experience, is, and I don't have a whole lot of data for this, of course, but um, but it's really helped, at least anecdotally, for my patients to kind of get through that radicular pain, which is, interestingly, one of the biggest problems that I've seen in terms of pain control after the procedure, if you don't do it, um, they, their central back pain may be gone or 50% better, you know, within a week or so, but... but it's that nagging sort of radicular pain that some of them will have. And if you get them an ESI, I've seen that it drastically reduces the, the incidence of that. Yeah, I, I, was, I actually really like that part of your presentation because I'm gonna incorporate that to my practice. I, I have had several patients, their pain character changes. Right. And, and I think the pain of the actual fracture was treated, but then there's this lingering other pain, exactly what you're describing. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, let me know how it goes. Yeah, I will. I will. You make it seem easy. <laughs> now, uh, as far as <clears throat> the role of adding thermal ablation to a non-pathological fracture, there's some data that's been released. Actually, I was involved in a in a in a paper with Ryu, um, but using the STAR system in a in a compression fracture. And, and it showed mm. that the results were a little bit better. You think there's any role there? Or hmm. is that kind of just too crazy? That's a good question. Uh, if it's coming from Bob Ryu, it's probably a little too crazy. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually don't Sorry, know. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> 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 I feel a little uh, embarrassed. I'm, I'm not familiar with that uh, study. Yeah, I'm no, sure. no it's, it's something I actually kind of forgot that we did. Um, but it was interesting. And one of our theories, it was only just an abstract SIR. It never became a paper. But uh, what we thought that maybe the thermal injury to the nerves mm -hmm. actually helped. And, yeah. And, and so it was interesting, and I always thought maybe there could be some role for it, but maybe not really anything soon. Yeah, yeah, I, th I like that idea, you know, because we all know, I, I explain to my patients when they have a compression fracture that really their, their pain is coming from those intraosseous uh, nerve fibers, you know, that are, that are they're, it's like a broken bone in the arm. Like if you don't set it, it's going to hurt every time it moves. And so I just tell my patients, I'm like, we're basically just, you know, setting your fracture uh, internally with some cement instead of a cat. So it's kind of an internal 
cast that, that we're doing actually, and that's just stabilizing those fragments of those nerve endings don't to move against each other. And I think the that's interesting. It's an interesting thought. I'm gonna steal that consenting process from you too. <laughs> sure, you can take <laughs> I'm that. I'm stealing a lot of little <laughs> ideas here. So you did mention, you know, you mainly see osteolytic lesions. Now, uh, osteoblastic, you still treat with this method? Yeah. Do you find it it's working? Are you, or what's your experience? We do. They're they're less common because I think a lot of those are actually well. Uh, well, uh, I treat typically with with the other radiate XRTs or approaches, you know. But um, I've had a few cases uh, where it does help. Now, the biggest problem with those procedures is really just getting into the lesion, because as we all know, like sclerotic bone lesions can be the bane of of a percutaneous intervention. But that drill that comes uh, in those kits really helps. Yeah, and you do yours under conscious sedation, which. I know my practice used to do before I got there. Now we do all ours under general anesthesia. Yeah. You ever do you see the patients react to pain during your procedure, especially during the thermal mm. portion of it, or no? Well, actually, I do all of mine under MAC or general. Oh, MAC or general. Sorry, I misunderstood that. That's Never okay. Mind. Okay. I'm glad we clarified that. Yeah. <laughs> I was like. I, I know people, well, what I, about vertebral augmentation on its own? Will you I typically use a Mac, you know, because okay. a lot of these patients are older and yeah. you know, prone. And uh, we, and contrary to popular belief, we do have some heavy people in Colorado. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? So, we would not uh, have known that. <laughs> it, we do have some, you know, I mean, their, their BMI might be 27. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Huge. I guess... What's, you know, I always find it interesting, what's the oldest patient you've treated? Uh, I think it's probably upper 90s. Upper 90s, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, it's rare, but I mean, it's probably 98, I think. How My about you? friend in Hawaii was just telling me how, I guess, the, the age, it's a lot longer. People live a lot longer here. It's on the main island. His oldest patient he treated was 106. Wow. So kind of kind of interesting. Age, age is, he says that they look like they're 70. Right, right. So. Exactly. Yeah, I don't think there's an age limit, really. I think you have to go by uh, pre-fracture uh, performance status, right, and, and what what yeah. the uh, what what their treatment uh, is going to do to them, uh, et cetera. For for those guys who are listening and and don't have this part of their practice, what what advice you know, top two things you would say they should start doing uh, in order to to incorporate this if they want that. Yeah, well, I would say, um, number one, uh, definitely go to your tumor boards. Um, I'm going to do three. So tumor boards, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, I think that's the low-hanging low fruit. But you do have to know some data. I mean, you're talking to oncologists and rad onks, right? So they're going to want to see your data because a lot of what we do, let's be honest, some is with very, you know, kind of poor data. Uh, but the more you can bring to them to the table the um, the studies that we've got, the basically the effectiveness studies and the safety profiles, I think the better you're off you're going to be. And um, don't be afraid to to repeatedly raise your hand uh, because the first time you raise your hand, you you may not get a you may not get a referral. You know, it may take two or three times or I don't know more. Second thing is um, my my big thing that I really uh, harp on is the lunchroom and the doctor's lounge, and um, not everybody has that anymore, especially at the academic centers. I think it's gone a lot, uh, gone away, just because of the cost, and I don't know, maybe they don't want to seem exclusive or whatever. But at our institutions, which are primarily um, a couple of hospital chains called Centura, um, and then Healthcare Corporation of America (ACA). Uh, they still have the doctor's lounges, and particularly in HCA facilities, they're extremely active, and uh, that's where a lot of consults also happen. You know, we talked about that earlier. And then uh, number three, uh, clinical practice, really. Pre-op, uh, you know, H&P with a follow-up letter to the referring doc, um, and then send them a follow-up letter after with your report, because a lot of, you know, typically I'm the one ordering the ablation procedure, so the report and the risk only get sent back to me. Um, so I have my assistant um, send a copy of every procedure report and a little letter and some images from the procedure. Yeah, yeah. you mentioned yesterday how you have a nice letterhead and all yeah. this. I think those little tiny details can really build your practice. And yeah. So it's awesome that you do it. The, the lounge, the lunch lounge, we luckily have one, and I agree. That's excellent. I always get a consult of, yeah. of, of something of sorts that you know may or may not have happened. Exactly. Now, 
Um, kind of we're nearing the end, but for someone who's never done, you know, one of these procedures before and no one's doing it in their practice, how are there training courses? Are there things that they can do to get exposure? Yeah. So I, I, I can speak about uh, the, and this is not a plug for any um, uh, device coming out. I don't do that. I'm, I, by the way, my disclosures are none. Okay. Uh, but um, by the way, yeah, but the uh, Medtronic folks do have some courses, and I, and I think Doug Beal in Oklahoma is one of their proctors. He does tons of vertebral augmentation, so in an OBL kind of setting. So it's a, I think his course I've heard is really good. I haven't done that. I was really confident with the vertebral augmentation mm-hmm. part of the procedure and really just had a um, long discussion with our local rep who I trust, and we went through the pre-procedural plan on the first case and you know, kind of went from there. Um, I th- the these devices are actually kind of built uh, not to be pu- foolproof, but they're pretty darn safe. Uh, safe. Not to say you couldn't uh, hurt someone, but um, I think the way the the systems are set up that you've got a lot you've got a lot of room for error, which you could actually end up under treating it also, and we don't. That's something you don't want to do either. True. So you, True. I mean, I. Um I don't have any disclosures either, and I've used both systems. I started off with the Merit Star, and I've been doing, I recently started mm-hmm. OsteoCool. And Medtronic did, you know, they had a ton of courses, and they're right. really great because it was a cadaver lab. It was a yeah. mobile cadaver lab. It's on like a bus. Right. And I actually learned, I was able to try so many techniques, you know, whether it was paravertebral, paraparticular trying a high T lesion, trying a C cervical lesion, and even sacroplasty. So I right. really recommend, I was already comfortable with the procedure by that time, but I learned so much. So mm-hmm. I think these courses, whether it's from Merit or from Medtronic, if it's a cadaver lab, I think it's one of the best things you can do, Yeah. Uh, especially for vertebral augmentation. Exactly, I, I completely agree. And um, yeah, I just encourage everybody out there, if you're not offering this, uh, and if you're interested, I think it's a wonderful tool to expand your practice and also really help out some people who can be really miserable. In my talk the other day, I kind of showed an extreme case of a vertebral plane with a lot of posterior expo- uh, retropulsion of a large fragment that uh, I think a lot of people would have been initially, uh, including myself, uh, really hesitant to take on that case. But it really helps build your practice if you're uh, someone that uh, is willing to take some measured risks. So I, I tell my patients, not all of them, but the, I tell my patients, listen, you've got this situation and um, if you're able to, you know, trust me, uh, I am going to be cautiously aggressive for you to, to really help you, you know, given um, these risks, we're going to um, take these safety precautions to make sure that you're as safe as possible, but we have a really good shot of helping you out and, and making you feel better, right? So, and most people are able to take that risk when they are comfortable by that fact, so. I'm going to steal another thing from you right there. So, uh, I love it. It's, uh, you know, it's been really great talking to you, Peter Horner, about all this. And uh, I, I do think this is an underutilized uh, procedure for a very big problem out there. And uh, mm-hmm. your suggestions of how to increase awareness and referral patterns and work with RADONC is, is something that um, I think can make this procedure more available and, and you know, decrease the terrible disease of back pain. Yeah. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Mahalo. <laughs> Mahalo. <laughs>